To summarize, my wife and I have been married for 11 years and have two children aged 11 and 9. Unfortunately, she was unfaithful for a period of eight months, and I discovered this truth during the past three months. However, I chose not to confront her until I had gathered concrete evidence, including video proof, and had consulted a trustworthy lawyer to prepare a separation agreement. This revelation occurred approximately nine months ago, commonly referred to as D-Day in this context. I patiently waited for her to return home from being with her affair partner, and when she noticed me sitting at the table, she immediately became anxious. I asked her to take a seat as we needed to have a serious conversation. By that point, I had already shed all my tears and no longer felt emotionally invested. From the moment I first learned about her affair, I had made up my mind about pursuing a divorce. My wife sat down, visibly worried. You're scaring me. What's happening? She asked. I reassured her that I wasn't there to discuss her infidelity, as I already knew everything. Instead, I explained that I wanted to focus on our separation and divorce. Placing my wedding ring on the folder containing the separation agreement, I slid it in front of her. This action brought her to tears, and she began begging, apologizing, and pleading, which were all expected reactions. However, I remained firm and rejected everything she said. Wife, I love you, but you have hurt me more than I have ever been hurt. Sleeping with other men is not a demonstration of love, I expressed, emphasizing my pain. After a couple of hours, I suggested that she stay at a hotel for the night, so that we could continue our discussion the following day. I made it clear that if she refused to sign the separation agreement, I would expose her actions to everyone immediately. I understand that her signature may have been influenced by the pressure of the situation, but at that moment, I simply wanted the ordeal to be over. Eventually, she agreed to sign. She left, and throughout the night, I received messages and calls from her. I responded briefly, stating that I would not read her messages or engage in conversation until the following afternoon. The next day, the gravity of the situation appeared to have fully registered with her. She earnestly implored for another opportunity, proposing marriage counseling and making heartful promises to do whatever it takes. I informed her of my intention to initiate divorce proceedings on Monday and granted her a 90-day window to convince me that terminating our marriage would be a mistake. I'm uncertain as to why I extended this offer. Perhaps I was feeling vulnerable, having already made up my mind to end things, yet I relented. The following day, I meticulously outlined a set of requirements for her, although I did not present the list directly to her. Instead, I informed her of its existence and explained that unless she adhered to these conditions, our communication would solely revolve around matters concerning our children, and the divorce would proceed without hesitation, with me disclosing her actions to everyone involved. Furthermore, I made it clear that even if she were to comply perfectly, it does not guarantee that we will not divorce. My trust in her has reached rock bottom, and my feelings of love have dissipated. The only reason I even contemplated salvaging our relationship was for the sake of our children. It was not my intention to convey this, but once again, I found myself unable to adhere to my initial decision. The list encompassed the following requirements. Firstly, she must provide a comprehensive account of her involvement with him, elucidating how it commenced and justifying her actions to both me and our children. Any attempts to omit or downplay any details would result in the termination of my efforts for reconciliation. Secondly, she is obligated to grant me unrestricted access to her social media accounts, phones, computers, earnings, and bank statements. Thirdly, she must regularly update me on her whereabouts and activities. Fourthly, she is required to attend individual counseling sessions two to three times a week until she gains insight into her own decisions. Couples counseling will be considered at a later stage. She agreed to these terms, compiled the list, and granted me the necessary access. Subsequently, I disclosed points five, six, and seven sequentially only after she completed each task. For the fifth requirement, she was obliged to meet with the spouse of the other person involved, confess everything, 
provide all evidence, and offer to testify in court if necessary. Initially, she resisted, stating that she couldn't bring herself to do such a thing. I emphasize that she prioritized AP's feelings over the well-being of her own family. I made it clear that if she didn't comply, any attempt at reconciliation would be abandoned. I was prepared to inform AP's wife myself if she refused. If she didn't take responsibility, I wouldn't even consider reconciling. Eventually, albeit reluctantly, she agreed and confessed everything to AP's wife. AP's wife reacted with anger, resorting to slapping, kicking, and pulling her hair. Despite the assault, my wife didn't fight back, and I refrained from intervening to protect her. As a result, she ended up with cuts and bald spots. Later, while in the car, I disclosed to her that AP had been involved with another woman besides my wife. I showed her the evidence gathered by the private investigator I had hired. I must admit I felt a sense of shame for finding satisfaction in witnessing her anguish as she realized she was just another conquest to this man. Following that, she had to have a conversation with our children and explain the likely consequences for our family. Additionally, she needed to confess her actions to our family and friends. As for myself, I decided to engage in a three-month affair, deceiving her and engaging in secretive behavior. During this time, I would emotionally connect with another woman, aiming for her to understand the pain and humiliation she had asked me to forgive. I wanted her to realize the risk of me falling in love with my AP and leaving her. After three months, eventually, I would truthfully disclose everything to her. The seventh step was particularly challenging for both of us. I pretended to cheat using Tinder and showed it to her occasionally. I acted as if I was secretly texting someone. I would disappear for entire nights and weekends, although in reality, I wasn't seeing anyone. I stayed in hotels, rented cabins, and Airbnb accommodations. Most of the time, I would simply get drunk and cry. My wife was becoming increasingly anxious, and I felt terrible as well. I despised it. I mean, I was only pretending. But even that was difficult. She seemed to handle it so effortlessly. I find it increasingly difficult to view her in the same light as before, which is the most challenging part for me. Initially, I wanted to demonstrate my willingness to forgive her, but instead, I came to realize the immense harm caused by such actions towards another person. Currently, we are undergoing marriage counseling, and while she is making some progress, I am struggling more. Some days prove to be more challenging than others. Although I have prepared the divorce papers, I have yet to take that final step. The reason behind my hesitation remains unclear to me. However, we are not as distant as we once were, and at least we have ceased arguing. I suppose that can be considered progress. She expresses genuine remorse, and I am aware that we have a long and uncertain journey ahead of us. I cannot shake off the terrible feeling I experienced while pretending, especially when she seemed to handle it so effortlessly. It has become difficult for me to view her in a positive light. At times, she appears more like a monster to me. I often wish I had ended things on the very first day. However, now we have both come a long way. Is there any way for me to alter my perception of her? I have managed to forgive other aspects, but I remain fixated on this particular issue. After seven weeks, I finally confessed to her that I had not actually been seeing anyone else. I could no longer continue the charade as it made me feel terrible. Furthermore, my wife and I spent the entire night discussing the post I showed her yesterday. Here is an update containing some of our thoughts and reflections. We acknowledge that our chances of success are quite low, and it may take many years to overcome the worst of it. However, this morning, we both agreed to make a genuine effort. Some of the things I said and the comments deeply devastated her. Nevertheless, we managed to have an authentic conversation, even though we do not always succeed in doing so. To all those who expressed strong opinions towards me, it is important to note that being in the midst of a situation like this is vastly different from observing it from the outside. Nothing is clear or straightforward. Emotions are overwhelming, 
and even the simple act of facing a new day feels almost insurmountable. If I were to attempt to elucidate the arduousness of maintaining clarity of thought and making sound decisions, allow me to present this analogy. Envision yourself living your life atop a towering mountain. From this vantage point, you possess an unobstructed view of the vast horizon, devoid of any uncertainties. Your mind is lucid, your thoughts are coherent, and you possess a firm understanding of your identity, desires, and aspirations. Now, imagine being abruptly plucked from the mountaintop, forcibly confined within a dark sealed box, and spun around at an alarming speed, causing your blood to rush to your legs. The sensation is so overwhelming that you teeter on the brink of losing consciousness. Your thinking becomes muddled, and you are plagued by waves of nausea and dizziness. Desperate to alleviate these distressing sensations, you would do anything to avoid succumbing to the urge to vomit. This analogy is the closest approximation I can offer to convey the profound trauma my mind endured in such a state. It is inevitable to make certain regrettable choices. I firmly believe that anyone would falter under such circumstances. To those who assert that we were causing harm to our children, we respectfully disagree. We have engaged in open conversations with our children, and they are genuinely grateful that we have been transparent with them and involved them in our endeavors. As my youngest eloquently expressed, they consider themselves an integral part of our family. They possess more faith in us than we do ourselves and appreciate that we seek their advice and value their thoughts. We have taken great care to reassure them that we will not burden them with the conflicts between us. Furthermore, we have made it abundantly clear that none of this is their responsibility or fault. They have conveyed their satisfaction in being included in the decision-making process and providing support to both of us. They offer kind words and embrace us tightly when they sense our need for solace. They comprehend that rectifying the situation may not be feasible, but they have made it unequivocally clear that they will feel disheartened if we do not make a genuine effort. The initial months were undeniably fraught with stress, but once the dust settled, they became truly appreciative of being included. Unlike some of their friends whose families are unraveling, they are grateful for not being kept in the dark. Thus, it appears that our children find themselves in a more favorable position than we do. I can only hope that we do not disappoint them excessively. To those who doubted my sanity and questioned my ability to be firm with my wife while discussing reconciliation, let me clarify that I had no intention of offering anything on the day everything came to light. Initially, my plan was to swiftly put an end to it. Even when she returned the following day begging for a chance and offering anything, I still intended to end things. However, in that moment, I found myself unable to follow through. I couldn't bring myself to walk away from her. I felt weak, ashamed, and angry. I wanted her to experience the pain I felt, but deep down, I still harbored feelings for her, even though I couldn't admit it or bring myself to end things. After some reflection, I compiled a list and laid out my conditions. I never anticipated that she would agree to them. The most challenging terms were ones I didn't expect, such as her confessing to the other person's spouse, disclosing the truth to her children, families, and friends. Furthermore. I never anticipated her standing by me during my pretend revenge affair. Honestly, I hoped she would give up, but I also wanted her to endure some suffering. I believed that her suffering would somehow alleviate my own pain. However, it didn't. As she fulfilled everything I asked of her, I could no longer deny that she was genuinely sincere, wanting to mend things, and deeply remorseful for her actions. She has been putting forth her utmost effort to reconcile. Unfortunately, I haven't been reciprocating in the same manner. I have been searching for reasons to give up and walk away or even attempting to push her into giving up and leaving. There were moments when I was incredibly cruel, unleashing my anger upon her. I acknowledge that I can be intimidating. Surprisingly, she has endured it all without making excuses. She doesn't try to defend herself. She simply absorbs it. She has told me that she has never been afraid of me, but I am not entirely convinced. She believes that I would never physically harm her, although I am not so certain. 
There have been instances where I have come dangerously close. I genuinely hope that I never, ever cross that line. I am truly scared that I might cause serious harm or even destroy someone. For those who inquired about her reasons for her actions, we have come to realize that she felt trapped and suffocated. Our life was too safe and predictable. After her best friend's death, she felt lost, and she became vulnerable to someone manipulative who knew exactly how to deceive her. Now she feels deceived and is struggling immensely to reconcile her choices with the person she believed she was. We discovered that this was a pattern with her affair partner. He had been cheating on his wife with two to three other women even before they started dating. We also found out that he has two illegitimate sons. As for me, I hadn't fully committed to reconciliation. I'm a tough person, capable of both enduring and delivering. I convinced myself that I'd find solace if my wife experienced suffering. I was open to walking away if I found a compelling reason. I was mistaken. I've been seeking reasons to keep my distance from her, still carrying deep wounds. Fear of getting close and hurt again held me back. This reluctance hindered our progress toward reconciliation. She's been the sole one fully invested. Some wondered if I could give love as effectively as I could punishment, and the truth is I can't. But I'm actively working on changing that. Now, while I've forgiven her, I've been keeping her at arm's length, attempting to find a reason strong enough to override my love for her so I could leave. I'll shift that approach and genuinely put an effort to reconcile. If we don't succeed, at least I'll know I tried my best, moving forward, even if it means risking more pain. Many condemned my wife, while others noted she's human and made mistakes. Currently, I'm responsible for handling the fallout from her poor choices, a role I didn't seek. I've spent a lot of time pondering this situation. I'm not exempt from making mistakes either. There are moments when I act irrationally and treat her extremely harshly. My urge to punish her has consumed me with hatred and anger, sometimes uncontrollably. Like her, I've lost control and made poor choices. We're both just human. I need to find ways for us to move beyond this together. I'll step down from my high horse and make an effort to contribute equally, 50%, to this relationship and our efforts to mend it. Regarding my wife, the day after D-Day, she realized the extent of the damage I suffered. There was no escaping it, no room for forgiveness, just emptiness. She understood that saving our family was a slim chance, but she was willing to do anything to try. It's evident now that she never truly loved A.P. She was drawn to the excitement, the illusion. She expressed gratitude for my unwavering and resolute approach. It snapped her out of the affair haze, brought her back to her senses, and refocused her on what truly matters. She believed her punishment was deserved, and it prevented her from hating herself as much. She thanked me profusely for not letting her off the hook, for pushing through. She's been harder on herself than I ever was, and she even contemplated ending her own life at one point, though she refrained because it seemed like an easy way out. I discovered that she's been harming herself since D-Day, hitting and pinching herself, her legs completely covered in shades of purple, a continuous black mark. It's not helping, though. We've agreed that her focus needs to shift towards forgiving herself. Our healing can't begin until that happens. It's a bit strange now that she's set on punishing herself. She's lost all those qualities that initially drew me to her. Her sense of humor, her smile, her well-thought-out opinions, her self-esteem, her loving patience. They've all faded. I find it difficult to rekindle my feelings for her when she's suppressing the very things that made me love her in the first place, the qualities that led me to be with her and marry her. All in all, We've made some progress thanks to the kind strangers on the internet. There's still a long road ahead, but we've pinpointed some major obstacles to overcome. We actually slept in the same bed for the first time since D-Day, so that's a step. It felt nice to be next to her again. I still have love for her, and it's a bit tough to accept. But then I think about my kids, and it gives me the strength to persevere. We'll strive to build something new since the old relationship is no longer here.
Update. This will be my final activity on this account as it has fulfilled its purpose, and I'm incredibly thankful for all the help I've received from everyone. There were times when it felt overwhelming. But I'm all right. Well, I should say we are all right. Ever since I committed fully to reconciling, there's been a remarkable improvement. We've even started reconnecting a bit. My wife, or rather the version of my wife I fell in love with, is starting to emerge more and more. We've been attending therapy sessions and making significant progress in our communication. We've also resumed being close regularly. While it's still early days and the odds may not be in our favor, we're making surprisingly positive strides. I'm making an effort to show my appreciation for her every day, and she's doing the same. Although there are moments of intense emotional pain for both of us, overall, we're experiencing more good times than bad. I believe we'll be all right. Our kids are doing well, and I have hope for the future. Update. I've received requests for an update. We're currently living apart. Initially, our reconciliation efforts were going well, and my wife did her part right. However, she's struggling to forgive herself and has a lot of self-hatred. On the other hand, I managed to hide my emotions for a while. The issue is that beneath the surface, my feelings were still simmering. Feelings of emasculation, betrayal, lies, humiliation, and anger were all bubbling underneath. As a result, I regressed into being mean, vindictive, and angry, and I'm no longer interested in being that kind of person. So, we decided to separate to give ourselves some space. We might attempt reconciliation later for the kids' sake. That's where things stand. Sometimes, it's just not possible to fix things completely. I'm not very optimistic about us making it in the end. This story impresses with its strength and inspires self-development. It demonstrates that even in the most challenging situations, people are capable of finding resources within themselves for change and growth. The key importance lies in making the right decisions and persistently pursuing goals. Story 2. My wife, who is 35, and we've been married for two years, was a college professor when this story unfolded. She had worked diligently to secure this position and rightfully felt proud of her achievement. Her parents were impressed, and we threw a grand celebration for her graduation and new job. Our entire family was present for the occasion, and we even postponed our wedding at her request to ensure she could pursue her dream job. This job meant everything to her, and I couldn't imagine her jeopardizing it in any way. However, unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. She became close friends with some of her students who were in their late twenties, making them close in age. While it struck me as somewhat peculiar that she was so friendly with her students while also being their professor, I refrained from expressing my concerns. She mentioned participating in their gatherings, which she described as casual hangouts rather than formal parties. She even shared that they discussed class topics because her students were passionate and dedicated. Despite my reservations, I didn't intervene. Looking back, I regret not trying to dissuade her from blurring the lines between her professional role and personal enjoyment. But she was just so thrilled. She truly felt on cloud nine and believed she was making a real impact on their lives. She always got back home at a reasonable hour because she didn't want to leave me alone all night and she didn't go out more than twice a month. I could sense something was off when she stayed out until 2 a.m. I was awake, waiting, and that led to a big argument. She claimed she was only assisting her students, but that explanation wasn't cutting it for me. I insisted on getting to the bottom of things, but she stuck to her story. I asked her to take a break from hanging out with students for a bit, and that set her off. She accused me of being controlling and started crying. She said she was a responsible woman who deserved to have her own life, especially when she found someone who brought her such joy. My eyes widened. She quickly backtracked, saying she got her words mixed up because I was confronting her, and she was exhausted. I was really bothered by her mix-up, but I didn't have the energy to keep arguing that night. I couldn't even bring up the idea of her taking time off from work. I didn't know how or when I could bring up the topic again. 
I knew I should have acted, but I decided to hold off and, and see what else she'd do. Things settled down for a bit. She stopped staying out late and only went to work and back home. It seemed good, although she had to grade papers at home, so I gave her space to do that. Then I caught her texting someone, and it startled her. It struck me as odd, but I didn't make a fuss about it. I thought about checking her phone later, but it had a passcode. I planned to create an opportunity for her to bring students over to our place while I'd be secretly nearby, keeping an eye out. I needed to figure out who these people were and if there was something more to it. She derailed my plan quickly. As soon as I mentioned spending an evening with my mom at the nursing home, she got excited. She called me sweet for doing it, offered to give me a ride, and said she'd pick me up later. To throw me off, I agreed and headed back to the house. It took about twenty minutes. I wasn't sure what I would discover, but I found it hard to believe my wife would do anything shady. A few times, I almost convinced myself I was being paranoid and started heading back to my mom's place. But then I changed my mind and turned back. When I reached the spot, I noticed a different car parked at our house. She thought she had all the time in the world to do her thing and then swing by to pick me up. Seeing that strange car got me all fired up, and I dashed to the front door. My hands were trembling as I unlocked it and saw the most unsettling sight I'd ever witnessed. My wife was getting close with her student, not even fully dressed yet. I quickly took a picture. You know we're in a high-tech era nowadays. I had my phone out when I saw the unfamiliar car so I could snap a photo of whatever my wife was up to, just in case things were innocent. I might have seemed like the crazy one, but now reality is starting to hit me. As she began to react after getting dressed, and her student took off, she started yelling things I couldn't even catch. My head felt like it was about to explode, and all I could hear was my own heartbeat. I thought about how our marriage was done for, and the future I had envisioned with her was a false dream. Her career was in ruins, she'd never get another chance to teach at that school. The next school would want to know why she got the boot from this one. I snapped out of my daze and demanded to know why she risked everything she had worked so hard to build for one of her very first students. She just stared at me with a blank expression, then spilled that he had invited her to hang out and she hadn't thought anything bad would go down. I lost it and started yelling, telling her that something seriously messed up had indeed gone down. She brought him to our place, and things got intimate. She started giving me the finger and shouting back, insisting it wasn't her fault and that I'd interrupted them, so it shouldn't even count. My jaw practically hit the floor. I let her know that her logic was so absurd that I couldn't even argue with it. I packed my stuff and got a hotel room. I wasn't in the mood to argue with her any more that night about who should leave. It was like I was dealing with a spoiled kid who thought she could get away with this because of all her past achievements. I wasn't about to stick around, and I wasn't going to let her hold on to her job either. I filed for divorce and sent the photo to the college president. Just like I figured, she got canned. She despised me and couldn't even look me in the eye whenever we crossed paths. I never saw her eyes again. She went from being this confident, flawless, high-achieving woman to someone filled with shame and disgrace. Even her parents couldn't wrap their heads around it and actually asked me to send them the picture. I did it, although I wasn't really into it. They said sorry to me. My wife wasn't working for any colleges in our state. After waiting for a few years, she moved out of state, maybe because she couldn't find a job no matter where she tried. I started dating again but I'm not going to be quick to trust someone's personality, or assume they'll always be honest. My day kicked off just like any other regular day. I woke up early, got myself cleaned up, gave a goodbye kiss to Emily while she was still asleep, and headed to my construction job. But little did I know there was something unexpected waiting for me. That usual day turned into something way more extraordinary. Later in the evening, while I was at the construction site working, I felt my phone buzzing in my pocket. I pulled it out and saw a message from my neighbor, Mike. He said, 
Dustin, your garage door is open. This struck me as odd since I distinctly remembered closing it. I thanked Mike and asked if he could shut it if he didn't mind. He agreed, and I went back to my tasks. However, that open garage door kept bothering me. I wasn't sure why, but something felt off. Trusting my gut, I decided to take an early lunch break and drove back home. As I got closer to my house, my heart rate started picking up. I noticed an unfamiliar car parked in my driveway, a car I'd never seen before. In that moment, a sickening feeling washed over me. I quietly parked my truck on the street and approached my own house without making any noise. I quietly opened the side door leading to the garage, and to my surprise, it wasn't locked. The door that connected the garage to the house was unlocked too. Walking through the house without my shoes, I came across the most heartbreaking scene. My wife, Emily, in the arms of a stranger. They were locked in a kiss with hardly any clothes on, right there in front of me. Rage consumed me, and everything turned hazy, making me feel like I was about to be sick. Stepping back a bit, I grabbed my phone, made sure the flash was off, and took a few photos of them kissing. I also recorded a quick video of them together in my own house. In that instant, it dawned on me that seeking revenge wouldn't bring me any real satisfaction. The best way to hit back at Emily was to make her fully realize what she was throwing away. It was time for a smart plan, one that would help me come out of this situation with my self-respect intact. Despite witnessing what I did, I paused to catch my breath, then quietly left the house, my heart feeling heavy like a lid weight, but with a strategy taking shape in my mind. I decided to reach out to a friend who happened to be a lawyer. I spilled the whole story to him and asked for his advice. Considering we were in North Carolina, I needed some proof to possibly lower the alimony I might have to pay. Armed with the evidence, I showed it to my lawyer buddy. Even though he wasn't a divorce attorney, he pointed me in the right direction and helped me understand the necessary steps to safeguard myself. He gave me the contact info for a respected divorce lawyer who could help me out. He said she was really good. When I met with the divorce lawyer, I didn't beat around the bush. I spilled all the details. She explained that North Carolina was a no-fault state, but cheating could affect alimony payments for the spouse getting support. We got the divorce paperwork sorted and talked about our plan moving forward. Emily had no clue what was going down. A few days later, my lawyer and I set up a meeting with Emily at a local cafe. She looked surprised to see me there, her eyes wide with confusion, and asked, Dustin, what's happening? I pushed the divorce papers across the table, and her expression went from puzzled to shocked. She stammered, Dustin, I don't get it. I looked at her, my heart aching, and said, Emily, I think you do. I saw you with him. Her face turned pale, and I could tell she was getting it. Tears rolled down her cheeks as she said sorry. Even though she was hurting, I knew I was making the right call. Over time, Emily refused to sign the divorce papers. By then, I'd already moved out of our place and found a small apartment for myself since the house belonged to Emily's parents. I wasn't worried about that. The day after she got the divorce papers, her parents stepped in and offered her financial help to hire her own lawyer. However, her parents didn't have a clue about why I was divorcing their daughter, and I figured Emily wouldn't spill the beans either. That's why I made up my mind to share the photos and video I, I took when I caught her with that guy in our house. I sent a package to her folks explaining why I was divorcing their daughter. After around six weeks, when the divorce hearing rolled around, her parents didn't show up. My lawyer told me she was going to try asking for alimony. She mentioned it probably wouldn't work, but she wanted to keep me in the loop. After hearing what my wife's lawyer said on her behalf, they alleged I wasn't a good provider and had been offensive in court. My wife just kept spinning lies. At one point, the judge cautioned her about telling the truth in court, warning that lying could get her into trouble, which is exactly what she was doing. Luckily, we presented the evidence to the judge, and he granted me the divorce without giving her any alimony. 
The judge gave me precisely thirty days to gather the rest of my stuff from the house. I only had a couple of boxes left to pick up. Around three months after the divorce was finalized, I sorted out plans to get my things. As I pulled into the driveway, I spotted the same car that Guy drove parked there. Seeing his car initially stung, but that feeling faded fast. This time, the garage door was intentionally left open for me to collect my stuff. Emily had messaged me suggesting that we meet up sometime, and I received that message one day. I agreed, wondering what she wanted to talk about. We had our initial meetup at the same restaurant where I had handed her the divorce papers earlier. She didn't seem like the confident and content woman she used to be. Instead, she looked like a pale shadow of her former self. She started talking, sharing how tough life had become for her. She expressed remorse for her choices and admitted missing me a lot. Despite this, her words didn't affect me much. I felt distant and uninterested in her explanations. I stayed quiet during her whole speech. When she finished, I turned to her and said, Emily, I hope things work out for you. But that part of my life is history now. Even after I made it clear that my decision was final, she kept trying to change my mind. She told me she was done with the other person and wanted us to reunite. As I walked away from the coffee shop, I had a realization. I had come out on top, not because Emily was sorry or upset, but because I had found a sense of contentment within myself. My life had turned around, and I had discovered my inner strength and moved forward with my life. I started my life anew, slowly piecing it back together step by step. The most satisfying revenge wasn't about getting physical or causing public humiliation. It was about moving forward with more strength and wisdom than I had before. After around seven months, Emily's father passed away due to cancer. He never showed any remorse for his initial anger when he found out about our divorce. On the other hand, her mother did apologize and invited me to the funeral. I was considering skipping it, but I didn't hold any grudges against her mother. I'm not the type to hold on to feelings towards others. The past can't be altered. As time went on, rumors started circulating that Emily was sinking even deeper into legal trouble. As things kept spiraling, she got arrested for drunk driving on a weekend, and her current partner was involved in shady dealings, including trafficking pills from her mom's place. How did I find all this out? Her mother still reaches out to me occasionally. Our marriage only lasted eight years before ending. This means she might have been entitled to spousal support for about half of that time. However, she went through with it anyway, and that had an impact on the outcome that was reached. This story about divorce and its aftermath illustrates the importance of protecting oneself and one's interests, regardless of difficulties. The person in this story showed strength, the ability to make tough decisions, and the capacity to move forward even through the toughest times. Story 3 this story is about unexpected twists of fate, about love and betrayals, about difficult decisions, and hope for a fresh start. Immerse yourself in this captivating narrative that will make you reflect on the nature of human relationships and the power of forgiveness. I met my wife seven years ago, married her after six months. Our son was born four and a half years later. At first, we were a perfect family. She was a good wife and an excellent mother. My wife first became withdrawn, then irritable, overly demanding. She did not like anything I did. I did not earn enough. I paid little attention to her and the child, although I only lived for the sake of the family. Her character deteriorated every day. But I could not even imagine that she could have someone, although I was told that they saw her with a man in a restaurant. But I did not pay attention to it. I'll never forget that day. We came back with my son from the country house and found neither her nor her belongings nor her documents at home. The savings that we had been putting aside for the renovation of the apartment were gone too. She left a letter where she confessed that all her life she had loved another man and married me only to forget him. And after so many years, he found her. And now she wants to be with him. She thanked me for all the years of life spent together, asked me to forgive her, not to look for her, and to forget her as soon as possible. 
She also asked me to take care of our son and promised that as soon as circumstances allowed, she would definitely take him away. How could I explain her disappearance to him? She asked me to think of something. Maybe someday he would be able to understand and forgive her, just like me. For me, at that moment, the world just turned upside down. I felt like a discarded puppy, but most of all, my heart ached for my son. He was very attached to his mother, loved her very much, and the fact that she left us could completely break a child's psyche. I had to lie, saying that mom went to Africa to treat sick children, and as soon as she cures everyone, she will definitely come back. And why doesn't she call or write? I told him that there is Africa, jungle, there are no phones, there is no mail, but as soon as there will be an opportunity, she will write. It was very hard to combine work and the upbringing of the child. As far as possible, a cousin could pick him up from kindergarten, sit with him, but it was obvious that my son was very much lacking maternal warmth and care. He asked every day where mom was, how mom was, and drew pictures for mom. It is clear that I could not pay enough attention to my son because of my work. Most of the time, the child was left to himself. I could not give him to a boarding school, bring another woman into the house, or start building a personal life. I could not. Firstly, there was no time. Work, home, son. Secondly, single fathers are not particularly in demand. Thirdly, I would not have been able to explain to my son why, while his mom was treating sick African children, I had another woman, and in my son's eyes, I would look like a traitor, not her. I also had to buy two gifts for the holidays, for myself and supposedly for mom. I asked an acquaintance to write cards and letters on her behalf, saying that she loved and missed him, and that they would soon meet. For a year and a half, I did not hear from my wife. I continued to lie to my son, although I did not know whether she was alive or not. I saved up some money and bought a trip for my son and me. He really liked this trip, and I even began to think that my son was slowly coming to his senses. And here, in one of the cities, we entered a beautiful temple, and when we went out into the courtyard, my son froze like a statue and began to look somewhere. I began to hurry him up, and he shouted at the top of his voice, Mommy. In one of the novices of this temple working on landscaping the site, I caught familiar features. Yes, it was my wife. She stood looking at us for a while, then cried, covered her face with her hands, and disappeared. I told my son that he imagined it, took him to the hotel, promised that I would find out everything and tell him, and return to the temple. First, I talked to the bishop, and he said that four months ago, a young vagrant had joined them. She looked miserable, almost in rags, named herself, and said that she had mortal sins on her, that she was even ready to take the tenure. I asked to see her, and explained everything, though without going into details. I had to wait for a long time. And finally, she came out and sat down next to me. She was completely different from the wife I had known before. All her arrogance, her insolence, her willfulness were gone. Beside me sat a mere shell devoid of any joy in life, with a trampled and tortured soul. She was broken and crushed. At first, we just sat in silence, and then she began to say that for what she had done, there was no forgiveness, that she was not worthy to be a mother, and in general, had no right to live. And it wasn't just that she had abandoned us with her son, although according to her, not a day went by that she didn't think about us. There was something worse. I thought it couldn't get any worse than what she did to us, but it did. Before me, she dated a guy she was madly in love with. He was from a local youth group of Gopniks, but he knew how to woo beautifully. They even planned a wedding, and then he went to jail for robbery and murder. He himself asked her not to wait. He said that after he got out, he would have no plans for her, but he told her that on purpose not to break her life. He didn't want her to wait. And then she met me. She didn't care anymore. And then he got out early and found her himself. He said he couldn't forget her. Feelings flared up again. She didn't want to deceive anyone, to live on two fronts. 
That's why she left, though it was hard for her to part with her son. He convinced her that the son would be a burden to them until he unwinds. Let him live with his father. Only later it turned out that he did not want to bring up other people's children and wanted only his own. Now the most important thing. When she went to him, she was pregnant by me. On all terms, he immediately demanded an abortion. Since the term was already late, the abortion came with complications. The more it was done in a cheap clinic, almost criminal. She got an infection, and she can no longer have children. She had an abortion while married. We are still not officially divorced and married. Then six months later, he left her and found someone who can bear him a child. To return to the family after all that she did, she simply could not. She had no right. She tried to commit suicide, but she was saved. Then there were three months in a mental institution, walking with a pillow, saying that it was her child, then wandering, sleeping wherever she could, eating whatever she could find, and finally ending up near this temple where she stayed. They took her in, gave her shelter, she confessed, and now she belongs here. She said that she would beg the Lord for forgiveness for everything she had done until the end of her days and would pray for me and my son. To this, I answered her that she deprived one of my children of life, another of maternal love and affection. She made me lie to my son, but I am not going to lie to him all my life. She decided for us, for all of us. And now, if my son had not seen her, I would not even go near her. But he remembered that mom, a real good mom who treated sick children in Africa, and to betray my son a second time, I will not allow. So she is now immediately packing her things, changing into worldly clothes, and we are going to the hotel where her son is waiting for us. And from there, we will go home. She should beg forgiveness not from God, but from her son, and not with prayers but with good deeds. She began to protest, saying that she could not, to which I replied that in that case I would bring my son here, and then she would tell him herself. But if he found out the truth, it would break the boy, just kill him morally. He would shut down, become bitter. I can't say that I was wrong, and it wasn't her either. He saw her, and he's tired of living a lie. He only raves about his mom coming back. And if there's a drop of humanity left in her, she'll come with me immediately. She obediently changed her clothes, packed her things, said goodbye to everyone in the temple. She had a long talk with the priest, and in three hours, we were at the hotel where our son was waiting for us. I will not describe their meeting, a lot of tears, emotions, and everything else. Back home, you can see from her that she's repentant. She won't leave her son, and he won't leave her. In character, she's the opposite of the wife. I knew before she left. She is soft, submissive, and she has become devout. She regularly attends church, prays constantly, and quotes the Bible. Now, as for our relationship with her, she tries in every possible way to beg for my forgiveness. She tries to pick up the pieces of what she herself destroyed. I, of course, in this plan to meet her, do not go, but especially also do not resist. Maybe some time will pass, and I can forgive her, but to date, I made it clear to her that she returned only for the sake of her son. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.